Got your thinking caps on? Got your notepads out? Ready to go. All right, so there are many of you here who know me, and there are guests here who do not, so I believe I've introduced myself. So for, uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I am going to uh, just give you a little bit of my background. Uh, before I do, you know what? I don't want to talk about me. I want to find out more about you. I mean, what are you here to, what do you want to learn about tonight? What are you here for? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Lauren uh, Paulina. Um, I've got an email online. Uh, I am a registered nurse and also a community resource nurse uh, for 50 and up. And so I go to different um, uh, workshops and events um, like this one so that I can have a resource for uh, clients that I visit that are in need. And so from talking to some of your current We do these month. We do these workshops every month, sometimes more often. So it's a good place to learn. Yes. Yeah, so thank you for sharing. That's awesome, Sylvia. Uh, my name is Sylvia. I am from Colombia, in South America. Uh, I don't work with health, but this uh, recently, quite recent, uh, discovery of the gut brain connection, mm -hmm. and also. which is so important and yeah. each time it's more important and they discover more and more. Yeah. That's why mostly Well, that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. So yeah. yes, thank you for sharing. That's awesome. Gina, anything specific? Well basically, you know, you hear so much about the gut connected to the brain, all these different studies and I'm in the medical field and I would like to learn more about it and also for my family and for the patients. Absolutely good. Well, I'm thankful for that you're here. I'm excited to share with you what we've got tonight. And uh, we're all going to learn, and we're all going to go. Hi. Hi, Dr. Hi. 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 What's your name? Hi. Uh, oh, wait a second. I know yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good. Yeah, you kind of look a little bigger. How are you, buddy? Best to see you. Okay. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I've, I've been in practice here for uh, about 30 years or so. Um, I, uh, you know, you, you have... You have chiropractors, and you know a lot of them will typically work on lower backs and car accidents and things like that. I do things a little bit different. I'm really more neurologically focused. Uh, a lot of health, specialized health challenges. Um, sometimes we're, you know, average mediocre chiropractic fails or medical, you know, cases fail. They'll find their way here. Um, my dad was a not a mechanic. He was an engineer. They used to call his. Uh, they used to call them the last chance garage. So uh, it's kind of like that a little bit. I like specialized cases, I like challenges, and um, that's why I'm still doing this. And we do these workshops because we're out on the cutting edge as far as the nutritional part of things. I have authored two books, uh, Born Champion and True Wellness in the Workplace. And um, I, I continue to you know just stay plugged into um, all of these uh, developments as far as the research. I'm gonna share a lot of that with you tonight. I have uh, served as the past president for the Florida Chiropractic Society. Some of you here know me, you don't even know all, all these things. I've never shared that with you, but I'm glad that I am right now. So um, a lot of the um, things that we're gonna talk about tonight are based on a principle called salutogenesis. Has anybody ever heard that word before, salutogenesis? Salutogenesis. Saluto meaning health, genesis means the beginning, yes. And so really what salutogenesis means that instead of focusing on the problem and treating the problem, we focus on health, where it comes from, and how to support health in your body. So it's a different approach, and that's really the reason why we've been so successful with helping so many people, because we start with a different premise, a different uh, philosophy, so to speak. But um, everything that you're gonna hear tonight has really nothing to do with my opinion. It's all gonna be based on science, fact, and research. And it's also gonna hopefully encourage you to really be reminded that your, your body is smart, it's intelligent. How many of you believe that um, you were born to be healthy? Like you should be healthy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And so we all have the ability to do better. And you know, if you if you share that mindset, then you're going to leave here encouraged tonight. Um, if you never ever come back, I hope that you do come back. I'm here to help you. I want to help. But even if you never do, the resources that I'm going to share with you tonight are going to be life changing. Just the information is going to be life changing. Yes. Functional medicine, some of it, it will touch into it. Yes, it will touch into it. That's a good question. Um, but uh, for those of you who are guests, you will be getting follow-up emails. And uh, just because there's so much information and uh, you want to stay plugged into this, it's going to be like drinking out of a fire hose for many of us tonight. So you'll, you'll be getting these emails. You can opt out of them after, if you want to, but you'll be getting follow-up emails so that you can track with this. Um, <clears throat> so... I'm going to go ahead and jump right into this. So we're going to learn first of all what's going on, secondly, uh, why it's happening, and then lastly, what do we do about it? What's next? So to start off with some statistics as far as autoimmune disorders, you'll see that currently about 50 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder. Um, it's a 300% increase really over the past several decades. 75% more prevalent in women autoimmune disorders than men. Men do experience it, but 75% more in women, and then uh, over 100 billion spent every year in the U.S. So it's a, it's a growing problem. Researchers now, I'm going to share with you, <clears throat> they really believe it points back to genetic predisposition and environmental factors. What two things? Genetics, Genetics and, the and the environment. Yeah, so these are, these are causative factors. So <clears throat> autoimmune diseases come in many different flavors, forms. You see brain problems blood problems, gastrointestinal disorders, nerves, your lungs, skin conditions, muscles, bones, and thyroid. It affects different people in different ways, and I am going to share with you why. Anxiety is uh, one of the things that um, uh, really expresses itself through this gut-brain disorder or dysfunction. Um, they say it's the most common mental Ill illness in the United States. Um, 40 million adults, uh, 42 billion a year, so it's a very real thing. Raise your hand if you know someone who has anxiety. <clears throat> yes, super common. Um, I would say almost all of us know somebody, including ourselves, that we've experienced that at some time or, or another. And uh, this is what drives the, the gut brain problems, makes it worse. Nine million kids, kids have an anxiety disorder. Depression is another issue that they're now seeing is linked to the gut brain axis dysfunction. So depression and anxiety are two very real things that um, is, has dominated our population, and not just adults, but kids also. It's, uh, it's really become quite the epidemic, especially these last three or four years. Have you noticed that? Yeah. It's more prevalent now than ever. Social um, media. Social media, yeah, it's, yeah. oh, yeah, we, could, we yeah. could open up a can of worms on that, but it's yeah. the number one cause of disability worldwide. And that doesn't surprise us. One out of 33 children, one out of eight ad adolescents deal with depression. So what we're talking about is chronic illness, which is the leading cause of death and disability in the United States. 70% of deaths are from chronic health conditions, and 50% of our population have at least one chronic health condition. <clears throat> so $2.3 trillion per year spent on treating these conditions. So we don't really just have an explosion of autoimmune disorders and diseases, really what, what we have is a, a, a problem with our health. Our, our health is a society, we're a sick society. And when you leave the United States and you go to different countries, what you'll see is that there are people that don't suffer from as many autoimmune disorders, people don't suffer from heart disease um, in the numbers that we do, cancer, people don't take as many medications as in the United States. So really this is, um, it really points more to the United States and a lot of the problems that we're having here with our with our healthcare system and the way that we approach correcting the cause of these problems. The problem is that we don't correct the cause of health issues in this moment. We, we just treat what? We, we treat symptoms, treat effects. So the system is set up that way and it's a problem because there are doctors that are trapped in this system and they see the problem but they can't really do anything. They have their hands tied because they work for these facilities, and that's the administrative red tape that they have to deal with. Half my family are medical doctors. I was, I was the first chiropractor in my family, so I know this is a real thing. It's a real frustration for a lot of physicians. So it's not the doctors that are to blame. 
it's the system. And we can see the statistics for what we suffer for. So let's, uh, let's, let's get down to understanding why and cause. So everybody probably got here by car today, right? And um, so took one of these. And what does a car need to work? Needs what? Yeah. Needs gas. So it needs, it needs power. Yeah. What about parts? These parts too, yeah. these parts, and um, and then what else does it need? A car can't drive itself. Drive. What else does a car need? Needs a driver, needs information. I mean, it, even a smart car needs something to program it, and, yeah. and uh, that kind of scares me. Uh, that, at any rate. I don't know about you guys, but, uh, uh, but, but, but a car doesn't drive itself. It needs information, it needs intelligence to make all these things work, right? Same thing with a computer. How do computers work? What do computers need to work? They need what? Parts, power, and information, right? You have to have parts, you have to have a hard drive, you have to have power for it to power up and work, but what can a hard drive do without software, right? So the software is really the intelligence, but really you need people programming these things behind that. So you can have all the parts and the power that you want, but the problem is that if you don't have the information or the intelligence to drive these systems, then they're going nowhere. Right or right? Make sense? So what do living systems need to work properly? Well, you, you got the answers to the car and the computer. What's any different? Yeah, it's the same thing, right? Living systems need parts, they need power, and they need information, right? And isn't it amazing, we go to doctors all the time, and we have parts doctors, right? We have a knee doctor, we have a heart doctor, we have lung doctors. We got a doctor for almost every part of the body. Which is good. We need those. We need doctors. We need specialists, and um, and then we have we have now we have power doctors, right? What's the power? A lot of nutrition. People are seeking nutrition. What's that? Energy. energy. Yeah. How do you get more energy? Detox, herbs, and things like that. That that helps with our energy. That helps with our power. But what about information? What is that talking about when it relates to the human body? I need a brain. brain. Need a brain. Nervous. 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 Okay. You need a brain. You need a nervous system. Very good. Heart. What's that? Heart. You need a heart. So these are all, but these are all actually, they're really parts. The brain is a part. A dead person has a brain also. A dead person has a nervous system also. But what does a dead person not have that you and I have? Life. 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 Intelligence that's flowing from the brain, like the software. It flows from above down, from the brain down the spinal cord, out through the nerves, to animate all the parts and intelligently enable your body to stay well balanced and healthy and coordinate all the functions and healings in the body. Does this making sense? We're trying to look at it from a, 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 a different perspective. And really this is, this is a different way of approaching your health. Because you need parts doctors, you need to look at how do you get the right energy and detox and all that, but you also have to look at what's making all of those things work. What's, you know, how does your stomach know how to digest food? How does your heart know how to beat? How do all the cells in your body know how to repair and regenerate themselves? Is this making sense? Say yes? yes. Okay, I just want to make sure you're not sleeping. <laughs> so because systems are made of parts, they're all designed to eventually what? Break down. Break down. Right? And so what happens if you take away or change the parts, power, or information to the plant? You know, it gets less light, polluted water, the soil is polluted. What What's going to happen to that plant? It's, it's going to grow brown, disease, wilt over, die, right? It's gonna, there's stress there, and that's gonna cause sickness to that form of life. Is that making sense? So what, what happens if you do that to a human being? Same thing, poor nutrition, toxicity, stress, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have effects, you see? So you have cause, and you have effect. And what, in the long run, if you don't correct the cause, the source, and the root of why things are not getting better with an individual's health, if you're only treating the effects, then how far do you get? And look, look at as, and I'm not saying we don't need medications and prescriptions, and you know, we need these. But the problem is, is that when we start taking one after another, we have side effects from some of the prescription drugs, you start taking medications for side effects, and before you know it, you look around, and you wonder why the average senior citizen in the state of Florida is on, you know, eight, 10, 12 different medications, right? 
I always ask, okay, is there a different way? Is there a better way? Is there? You know, and, and, th and this is what I want to explore. Again, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we don't need doctors. I'm not saying we don't need, it takes a village. We need, we need everybody to work together in the best interest of the patient. Does everybody agree with that? Yes. But we can't look past the cause. You can't just keep treating effects and expect to increase and improve the quality of life of an individual. That's just, that's just doesn't work out like that. So it always comes down to cause and effect. Let's just break it down. I want to, I want to try to simplify this for you. This uh, comes from Dr. Paul Hardy. He was, he was um, and he still is one of the greatest brilliant minds in working with uh, autism, uh, but it goes really back before then. <coughs> this is just one way to ex explain cause and effect and how people exhibit health problems. So if you look at this, it says gut brain quadrangle. Can everybody see that? What, you'll, what you're, we're gonna talk about is that when you have health issues, it's really a whole body disorder. When you have an autoimmune disease, it's a whole body disorder. When you're, the way that your body expresses symptoms is different from the person sitting next to you. If you look at this, you have a nervous system, I have a nervous system, everybody has a nervous system, right? Mine is different than yours. You have an immune system. You have a detoxification system. You have a GI system. And you know what? We have our individual genetics, which are different, right? I know personally for me, my DNA test showed that I'm missing four out of the seven genes that helps me to detoxify properly. Most of you in here, you probably have them. So for me, I know I need to focus on my detox in order for my cells to function properly and to be able to handle the stresses in my environment. Does that make sense? So we're all different. We all have different genetics. Genes are important, but they're not the end all be all. So what this shows is that we all have stress. What kind of stress do we have here? Mental stress, what else? Chemical, Chemical stress, toxins, right? Physical stress. And when you put this into a person's life, it has to get filtered out through all these systems. And what happens is, as a result of that, in a person like myself, who let's say I'm getting more toxins in than my body can get out, all of a sudden what happens is my body becomes inflamed. And then on the other side of that, I'm gonna wind up with what? Symptoms. I might experience fatigue. I might experience brain fog. I might experience insomnia. Hey, that's just me. But you know what? You're different. Everybody is different because we all have different what? Genetics. But we all have all these systems, the nervous system, immune system, detox, GI system. It's interesting, I didn't make this. A medical doctor made this. Why do you think they put the nervous system at the top there? Because it controls all the other systems. Yeah, it's the most important one. So we have to understand how this works. Um, it's, it's completely different for everybody. So what we try to do is we optimize each of these sim uh, systems. When you look at each individual system and you learn things to do to optimize them, then again, some of you guys weren't here when we started. The, going back to the word salutogenesis, means health and then the beginning of. How do you elevate and support these systems of health in your body, right? That's what this comes back to. So we wanna look at supporting all these different symptoms, or systems, I should say, so that your body can handle stress. Raise your hand if you have stress. Not one of us doesn't have stress. It's part of our environment, right? It's not the stress that causes the problems. It's how your body adapts to the stress. All right, so it sounds like we're all on the same page. Here's another way of, of processing this. <clears throat> we have our genetic predisposition and environmental stressors, as we just talked about. Now, that can lead to something called microbiome depletion. What is the microbiome? Does anybody know? It's, it's you got the gut, right? Yeah, the gut, the gut. The brain is it's, it's moving like a motor. So it's so so it's all the good bacteria in your butt, in your gut, right? It's, so it's 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 responsible for um, your immune system, the serotonin. It's responsible for protecting uh, your body from bacteria, viruses, proteins, infections, inflammation. 
So the problem is, is that you can deplete that microbiome, which is, which is a protective part in your gut, for your overall health and communicates with your brain. You can, you can deplete that by many different things. C-section. How does a C-section uh, become a factor with your microbiome? Well, the, 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 the first sample of the microbiome comes from the vaginal canal as a baby passes through. So if you take them through C-section, they just, they omit that, they miss it. C-section is where they make a cut here instead of the baby coming through the vaginal canal it comes through the stomach. There was a, a lady sitting right in your seat the last time I did this talk. She was an OBGYN. And, uh, and what I told her was, <clears throat> I said that what, what they're doing now is they're actually taking samples from the vaginal canal and they're inserting it into the baby's mouths so that they can start the microbiome development. She was sitting right there. She said, yep, that's exactly what I do. So this is a real thing. And they're realizing right now how overutilized. They're starting to see how damaging it is to just go ahead and do a C-section at the drop of a hat. Florida is one of the most common places that they see that. Some C-section rates are as high as 35, 40, 50, 50 percent. Um, so, and these these other things, antibiotics. You guys know it decimates all the all the good bacteria, right? How can you recover it? Uh, we're, you're one step ahead of me. <laughs> I won't let you leave without the answers. Um, so you guys know antibiotics, you know, they, you're getting them to take an effect, to kill an infection, but at the same time you're killing all, all the good bacteria in there. So you're wiping out the, the microbiome and over, over time this is what drives things like depression, uh, autoimmune disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. There's, you're going to learn about the connection with this. Dementia, yeah, yep, yeah, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you're, it's all coming up here. Drugs, um, not just um, uh, prescription drugs, not just recreational drugs, all drugs, any, any, anything that, especially that's made in the laboratory. Um, poor diet, chronic stress, alcohol, and al altered vagal tone, the vagus nerve, we're gonna talk about that in a minute also. So that's what causes leaky gut. That's why you guys are here. You wanna, you wanna learn about the gut-brain connection well, this is what starts the, uh, the snowball rolling downhill. And then from there, it, gets, it can get worse and it goes to leaky brain. You have these autoimmune reactions, immune hypersensitivity, allergies, brain inflammation. Things start crossing the blood-brain barrier and that just takes it to a whole nother level. So this all leads to multiple nutritional deficiencies and what else? Toxicity. Yeah. So this is what leaky gut looks like. <clears throat> Basically, what is leaky gut? It's when your gut leaks. You know, so if you look at all the cells there that are, that are stacked up, what you notice in the first three, they have tight junctions. Nothing can get through there. But when you look at the other ones that are leaky and inflamed, there's spaces in there. And that protective barrier there gets broken. And then if, when, when vac viruses and bacteria and proteins can actually get through there, your body's gonna have an inflammatory response. Because inflammation is a protective response. That's how your body tries to heal itself. But there's pain, there's inflammation, there's all types of problems that start to erupt at this level. Is that making sense? Yeah. So, um, so, so when you when you start um, destroying or um, causing problems at this level, this is the foundation for which all the other problems start to develop. But you see all the things that lead to it: bad diet. Antibiotics, infections, drugs, stress, toxins, hypersynthetic response, alcohol. So, you know, obviously these are the things we want to start removing. I'm going to talk more about that in just a second. But did you know, you know what serotonin is, right? Yeah. It's a neurotransmitter that actually gives you the feeling of well-being. Well, they're, link, they're linking depression to a lack of serotonin, right? That's, that's where you know, the prescription for the SSRIs, the antidepressants come in, but 90% of that serotonin is not made in your brain up here, it's made in your what? Gut. Gut. It's made in your gut, from the microbiome. That's why they call the microbiome, or the gut, the second brain. Did you know that 70% of the immune cells are in your digestive system? 70% of your immune system. So what is your immune system there for? Fight off what? <clears throat> Colds, flus, COVID, cancer. Yeah, and so when you're weakening that, what are you doing? You're increasing your risk of all of that. Um, so your, your, your microbiome contains 100 trillion bacteria, 500 to 1,000 different species. 
So I'm going to share with you an interesting clip here. Let's give you context. So, so you think you're human? There's seven billion people on this planet. You know how many microbes there are? Five non-million. Five non-million. That's mm. the number of stars in the universe multiplied by five million. Mm. That's a lot of bacteria. Mm. And they're everywhere. They're on this floor. They're in your kitchen sink. They're on your chair. They're on your coffee cup. And yes, they're on you. Mm. You harbor a hundred trillion bacteria in and on your body right now. That's only a thousand times the number of individuals on this planet. And if you look at it in terms of cells, you are outnumbered ten to one. You are not human. You are a walking bacterial colony. That's amazing, isn't it? Really, that's how important bacteria are. You know, you can't get rid of germs. We're like, we've been, we become so germophobic. Like, you just, you, the germs are always there. When you're healthy, we have those germs inside of us. You know, when you're sick, when you have symptoms, you just have more of them because your body has become a right host for them to multiply. When you're healthy, they're still there. They're just not making as much of a fuss. Bacteria, viruses, strep, and, you know, like all of that stuff is in us. But when your immune system is strong, they're not going to town on you like it's Thanksgiving. So we live in harmony, and we have to learn how to adapt with those organisms because they outnumber us. So they have to be beneficial. They want us to be healthy, right? So we have to give them what they need so that we have a symbiotic relationship. It's to their benefit that we stay healthy. That's amazing, isn't it? So. Here are some signs that you have a leaky gut and brain. If you have leaky gut, most common signs, bloating, gas, cramps, food allergies and sensitivities, irritable bowel disorder, irritable, irritable bowel syndrome, hormonal issues like um, PMS or PCOS, um, fibroids, things like that, thyroid problems, joint pains, and skin conditions, especially uh, inflammatory conditions, a acne also. Um, signs of a leaky brain, like we said, a little more complicated, um, these are, these, this is when the condition progresses. Chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, brain fog, mood issues, <coughs> anxiety, depression, ADHD, neurodevelopmental issues, and autoimmune diseases. So, um, so these, are, these are the things, the, these are the terms that we've heard circulating around and we don't understand where they're coming from. Well, now you're learning. This is, this is where it all stems from, the, the gut-brain connection. What are some foods that cause leaky gut? Gluten? You guys know that, right? You know how good gluten is for you, right? Um, so we know we're supposed to avoid gluten. Um, most grains also, even seemingly good healthy grains. They're not good today. Well, most of them are, you know, there's, they, they've been, there's cross hybridization. And so unless you're getting organic and, you, and you're hundred percent sure they're, they're non-GMO, still we want to have them on a limited level. Um, sugar, right? What does sugar do? Right? Yeah, sugar, sugar takes over, you know, uh, and, and literally it causes all, all of the cravings that we have for sugar are, are from the sugar because they're making progress. They're just decimating our microbiome and taking away all the good benefits and, uh, and they're, they're having a, a, a party as they replicate all of these bad bacteria. Sugar is feeding them. Sugar feeds cancer too. Did you know that? I'm starting to work on that workshop too. Um, so, uh, artificial sweeteners, not much better. So these are these are the things again. If it's made in the laboratory, you really got to be careful with that and the acidic effect that it has on your gut. Conventional meat. What's wrong with conventional meat? It's processed. It's, it's, it's not so much that meat is bad for you. It's what they do to the meat. What are they doing to the meat? What are they feeding cows? Genetically modified. Corn, Monsanto, yeah, yeah. So, so you want to get grass-fed. Get grass-fed as much as you possibly can. 
It may cost a little more now, but it's definitely less of a cost than treating disease for the, for the last, you know, half of your life. Um, conventional dairy, same thing. Um, refined vegetable oils. What's wrong with refined vegetable oils like corn oil, safflower oil, um, canola oil, soybean oil? What's wrong with all these rancid vegetable oils? What's wrong with them? All modified. They're, they're all high in the omega-6, which drives inflammation. Okay, so it used to be that the proper ratio omega-3 to omega-3, so omega-3 is the one that helps repair and regenerate the cell membranes. It's, I mean, your brain needs it, every cell in your body needs it. We actually test for it in the office to see that you have the right level. It's that important, but it used to be one to one. Now it's like 16 to one, omega-6 to omega-3. So if we're trying to reduce in, in, an inflammatory condition, we have to get, reduce and eliminate these oils. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so, you, so you have to look for that on the label. GMO foods, tap water, I mean, you'd be surprised what kind of toxins we find in our tap water. Antibiotics, lead, pesticides. Um, also, we have to be aware of skin and hair cleaning products as well. A lot of these sudsing agents, makeup, the lipstick, for example. They, they tested 33 lipsticks, and I think it was 20, 20 or 22 out of the 33 lipsticks tested positive for lead. Um, so, so these again. This is we live in a toxic soup, basically. And, you know, it's, and at some point, you got more going in than your body can get out fast enough, and it becomes cumulative. And then your bucket starts to overflow, so to speak, and that's when we start experiencing symptoms, right? So, what are some foods that can help heal a leaky gut? Even if you don't have a leaky gut, these are good things to add to your body. Bone broth. <clears throat> yep. Raw, cultured, organic what? Organic dairy, loaded with good uh, probiotics. Kefir, yogurt. Make sure if you get the yogurt, don't get it loaded with the, sh with the sugar, right? You want to get the good, healthy yogurt. Greek yogurt is good. Um, butter and raw cheeses. Make sure you get, you're getting grass-fed butter, right? Grass-fed. My favorite is the Kerrygold. Um, and fermented vegetables, pickles, sauerkraut. All of the fermented vegetables. You, I don't know if you like it or not, but it is super healthy for your gut. Super healthy. Apple cider vinegar. Anybody like apple cider vinegar? Yeah. You either love it or you hate it. <laughs> you either love it or hate it. But you know, actually, I find that you develop a taste for it. Yeah. And um, you can just put a little bit in a, in a, in a half, half a glass of water. And um, it helps with your digestion. It helps with GERD. It helps with indigestion. It helps with, if you have it before you eat, it's actually good for your digestion. Coconut products, good healthy fats like that, sprouted seeds, flax, chia, hemp, organic grass-fed beef and lamb. Grass-fed, uh, grass organic, free range, and that can range from, again, your, your chickens, to your bison, to your lamb, to your grass-fed beef, and it's not too hard to find it. If you go and you look, next time you go into the supermarket, you can find it, they have it. Um, so it's good to have a variety. You never want to eat the same foods every day. You want to try to shake it up, but always get grass-fed. Make sure it's organic. Do not let the antibiotics in there. They pump those chickens full of antibiotics. They pump the meat full of antibiotics. And you are not what you eat. You are what you eat ate. Whatever you're eating, whatever they ate, that's what you are. And if it's loaded with antibiotics and pesticides and, and uh, genetically modified products, that's, that's what we're getting. And this is a huge part. You know, they've, they, now they, I mean, they've, they've done tons of studies of this where they see the application of glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, which 70% of the application of our crops is on corn and soy. And they looked at the application of that over the last 30 years, and it's directly proportional to the, the, the number of cases of senile dementia. Because it, it opens up the blood-brain barrier. So it's serious stuff. Uh, wild caught salmon. So, so I think um, you know, if you anybody want to take a picture of that, um, this is this is something that you can apply. Start doing it right away. <clears throat> Again, whether you whether you've been diagnosed with leaky gut, whether you know you you just want to be proactive, preventative. This is worth taking inventory. Open up your pantry, see what you're doing good, and see what you can do better. Yes. You can, you can eat sprouted bread, but beware the labels. Okay. Beware the labels. 
Uh, because it could say sprouted, but when you start reading the ingredients, there's a lot of no-nos in there. Yeah, there's gluten in there, there's all types of oils. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sugar. High fructose corn syrup. Yeah, in these, in these beautifully healthy, seemingly healthy breads. All right, so the literal connection that we're talking about here, where it all comes together, which ties to the brain, is the vagus nerve. Everyone say vagus. 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 Vagus in Latin means wanderer. And there's a really good reason for that. So whoever coined this term knew that it came off the uh, brainstem, right at, the, right, right at this level, and then it comes forward right in front of the top, the number one cervical vertebrae, the atlas, and then it drops down, and it literally um, reaches out to every organ in your body and controls it. So it's the, it's the second largest nerve <clears throat> in your body. And it literally controls everything. It makes everything either speed up or slow down. And it basically is there as a control mechanism to keep balance and function and harmony in your body and enable your body to adapt to its environment. That's what the vagus nerve does. Are you with me so far? Mm -hmm. All right, the vagus nerve is huge. For where we're going to go now, everything comes down to this. So your autonomic nervous system. Everyone say autonomic? Autonomic. Okay, when you say autonomic, we should be thinking automatic. It is automatic, because when you fall asleep, what keeps your heart beating? Your autonomic nervous system, right? What keeps your lungs breathing? What Your stomach's digesting food. All of these things happen by way of your autonomic nervous system. And which nerve regulates this? It sounds, it starts with the letter B, your what? Your vagus nerve, all right? So you have two parts to your autonomic nervous system. You have the fight or flight part, and you have the rest and digest. The fight or flight part speeds everything up. Your heart rate, respiration, digestion, it contracts your digestive system. Um, basically, it's fight or flight. Is it productive? Sure. If, uh, if a tiger is chasing you, you know, <laughs> if, it's a, if it's a survival response, absolutely. But what do you think stress does? Do you think it promotes the rest and digest part, rest and recovery, healing part? Uh, no, it, it promotes the sympathetic, which is the survival, fight or flight. What happens if you're stuck in fight or flight? Because you cannot adapt to all the stress that's in your, in your, in your life. What happens? You get sick. You get sick. It runs you down. It grinds you down, right? You, you have trouble sleeping. You don't sleep very well. You don't get good deep sleep. You don't get REM sleep. You don't get deep sleep. Your body can't recover. You wake up agitated. You wake up with a headache. You start getting high blood pressure. Your blood sugar goes up. You start gaining weight. You become pre-diabetic. Your immune system gets weak. You start getting frequent colds. Where you know you got a lot of problems. 75% of all myocardial infarctions, heart attacks, are in patients with what? They're in fight or flight. Is this making sense? Okay. So it's because there's an imbalance in that autonomic nervous system. Now what if? There was a way to create balance there. Do, do you see that as a possible pathway to a person's healing and better health? All right? So, interesting though, these are all the things which probably make sense. Somebody who's in high sympathetic dominance, diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome, poor sleep, insomnia, irritability, anxiety, fibromyalgia, excessive sweating, manic depressive focus, neuro neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and then uh, low parasympathetic dominant is, is similar to high sympathetic, but it's just underactive on this side. Constipation, depression, hormonal issues, fatigue, thyroid, adrenal, brain fog, mood issues, memory loss, autoimmune diseases. So the research is pointing to the correlation with, with, with these uh, conditions and how it relates to the autonomic nervous system. It's really fascinating. And how we, we literally have the key to unlock this now. So here's one researcher, um, a neuro, he's in the neuroscience department at uh, University College Cork in Ireland. Uh, they just interviewed him, and he's showing how stress actually alters the gut-brain connection. Because when you're stressed out, your body releases something called cortisol. And that's a, that's a hormone. And your brain perceives that, and what it does is it sends a signal to your gut to shut down digestion. And also, when you have high cortisol levels for a long time, guess what else it drives? Inflammation. Everyone say inflammation. Inflammation. 
inflammation. Inflammation, yeah. So when you're, you're under a lot of stress, your body gets highly inflamed, and it's just a positive, uh, a continuous feedback loop, and stress is what starts this whole process. So this is a real thing. Researchers are looking into how significant of, a, of an effect this is having on our general population and their health. This is really interesting. In this study, this talks about psychobiotics and the manipulation of bacteria gut brain signals. So they, gave, they, they have human studies and they have uh, studies with mice. And they gave them the good bacteria. They gave them probiotics. And they applied it to the mice in the, in the control groups who had, they were ex experiencing, I guess, expressing um, anxiety and, and depression. I guess somehow they were able to show how they exhibited that. Well, they gave them the probiotics. And you know what happened? They saw improvement with their behavior. And then, guess what they did? They cut the vagus nerve. And you know what happened? All the benefits went away instantaneously, just like that. So the literal connection to you getting any benefit of any healing in your body has to happen by way of that vagus nerve working properly because that's ultimately the conductor of your what? Autonomic nervous system, right? So <coughs> altered vagal tone in autoimmune chronic diseases they're coming out with research now showing how this is related to systemic lupus, altered vagal tone with rheumatoid arthritis, autonomic dysfunction in multiple sclerosis, autonomic dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease. That's really interesting, isn't it? So in the Journal of Internal Medicine, now what they publish is their findings on how they can help people with inflammation. So for example, um, as a therapy using a, a, a modality to reduce inflammation. You know what they did? Surgically implanted vagal nerve stimulators. Stimulated the vagus nerve to alter the tone, and what are they seeing? A reduction of inflammatory condition in the patients. That's, that's crazy stuff, isn't it? Journal of Physiology, another, again, these are medical journals, guys. They're saying the vagus nerve seems to be a good therapeutic target in what? Inflammatory conditions of the digestive tract, irritable bowel disorders or other inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. So you're seeing how important this gut-brain connection is, aren't you? So here's the ultimate question. How do we make application of this? How do you improve your vagal tone so that we can get better balance in our autonomic nervous system? That's a good question, right? Here's where the rubber meets the road. Here's how you make application with this. Positive social relationships improves vagal tone. What? What are you doing right now? This is somewhat of a social engagement. Friends, family, what does it do? It, bring, it brings you some level, some feeling of peace or comfort, right? And it stimulates the vagus nerve they have found now, interesting, we've seen this epidemic of depression, especially like the last three years. Where can we trace that back to? With the, with the outbreak of what? COVID, where they did what? Lockdown. Isolated everybody. Yeah, lockdown. And that's when all of this really exploded. And this is one of the factors that's related to that. Um, colds, yeah, like, you know, they talk about the cold plunge now. Anybody do a cold plunge? Anybody? Has anybody ever tried to? We just splash cold water on your face. It, like, it, it wakes you up. It almost gives you a jolt. And it affects the vagus nerve in a positive way. Gargling. Like a cold shower. A cold shower, yeah. Gargling. How about gargling? Gargling utilizes the nerves that are connected to the vagus nerve and stimulates it. Singing, chanting, humming. Um, have you ever noticed how some people have to do that to relax? You can see, I mean... If, kids that are on the autistic spectrum, what are they doing? They're always moving, always moving. Um, I, a lot of times I find myself, in order for me to relax, or in order for me to actually, you know, I, I'm more of an auditory person. Like, it's hard for me to look at something and listen and try to focus. But if I find that if I'm moving, like if I go for a brisk walk and I'm listening to something, or if I'm moving around, somehow, some way, I'm able to focus more and, 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 um, and, and retain more. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. And this all goes back to vagal tone. Massage, laughter, right? yoga, tai chi, breathing deeply and slowly. Everybody take a deep breath. 
There it is. Better vagal tone. And uh, exercise, we know that. That's a no-brainer. And what's number 10? Chiropractic. What? Chiropractic. How does that come into play? What does that have to do with anything? Well, you're about to find out. Um, studies um, show with uh, chiropractic and vagal tone, this, this one, the outcome showed a healthy autonomic nervous system balance after the correction of vertebral subluxation. Uh, a, a vertebral subluxation is when the vertebrae is out of alignment, irritating the nervous system. So that's what that relates to. Here's another study that was published in the Journal of Chiropractic Medicine. Neck adjustments had a parasympathetic or a vagal effect. What is a parasympathetic effect? Not the fight or flight, but the what? Rest and digest. So what they notice is that the blood, there, there are studies that have come out of the University of Chicago Hypertension Center where, I mean, they had a control group and they, there was a group that got sham adjustments and nothing happened to their blood pressure. And, they, and the control group that got the real adjustments, their blood pressure dropped an average of 17 points with, a, with an adjustment at that top bone that was affecting the vagus nerve. So this is a real thing and it's recognized in the medical community, but again, when you hear the word chiropractic in our community, what's the first thing you think of? Don't come near my neck. Don't touch my neck. Nothing wrong and I don't want a problem. So you can see this is totally different. Totally different. Now, this is again. I told you this is this is not my opinion. This is all medical research. It's all been published medical literature, guys. Chiropractic and decreased inflammation. What they found also because of the effect of the adjustment that it had a, a uh, it, it affected the pro-inflammatory cytokines, a reduction of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which had an anti-inflammatory response. What? Right, what are you saying? that when you actually make a chiropractic adjustment, it can cause a reduction in the inflammation in that person's body? I didn't say that. That's what that study says. That's what the study show. And yes, I do hear that, and I do see that, and we see that when we take care of patients. But again, that's not what the general public's perception of chiropractic is. You're watching too many YouTube videos. <laughs> you know, it's scary stuff. Now, listen to this. This is one of my patients, really bad, arthritic condition, one of the worst types of autoimmune conditions someone could ever be diagnosed with. You can see it when she holds up her hand. Rosie, I just wanted you to um, tell your story very briefly. You came in here only a couple of weeks ago, you were referred in, and what, what was the diagnosis that I thought you were given years ago? Uh, sclerosis scleroderma. Yes, and, and um, how long have you been um, living with that? Since 2002. And how has it affected your life? Severely, I can't do the most simplest thing is dress myself, tie my shoelaces, uh, it's hard to shower, I, hard to reach, clean my own legs. And so you've been under care now for just a couple of weeks. Um, what are some of the changes and improvements that you're seeing now? Uh, amazing changes. I can with less difficulty and less pain, which was my main complaint, put on my shoes, dress my socks. I have more movement. I can actually uh, feel myself being able to reach and wash my own back. Uh, I can carry out the garbage. I always had to call my neighbor to take out my can. I couldn't do that. Even cutting an onion was quite difficult. I also noticed the circulation in your hands is improving, the colors returning. Yes. And um, things are starting to uh, look better and better. Yes. I just wanted to share that with you because, I mean, ultimately it's, it's quality, quality of life that's the most important thing. We can go, we can, you know, go over this research till the cows come home, but these are real lives, real people. And, you know, that's what we're here to find out. Like, how do you make application with this? When I, when, it, when for, the, for those of you who are guests here, it's, it's not like what you see on YouTube where we go and we're just like literally trying to break somebody's neck. You know, it's, it's a very, uh, very carefully studied um, application and instrumentation that we use to address the vagus nerve. And we do that by accessing the top vertebrae in the neck. And when you do that very specifically and scientifically and carefully, it doesn't take much for that to happen. It just takes time, that's all. Healing takes time, right? And, and there's a way to these things, but you can't go by what other people say. Don't, don't go by what other people say or what you see on, 
on YouTube or some of these videos. It's, that's not what we're talking about here today. We're not talking about manipulation. We're talking about very specific adjustments. It's like fine tuning the dial on a radio. You know, like remember the older radios when you, when you fine tune the dial on the FM and it goes from static to clarity. When the cells in your body can hear a clear message from the brain, they start to regain function and healing. And that's what the adjustment does. When you get that vertebrae lined up properly and there's no interference on the nervous system and the vagus nerve starts to conduct and coordinate both parts of that nervous system, that autonomic nervous system, we see this happen. So what is a vertebral subluxation? What is it? Does anybody know? So it's right there. It's a misalignment of the spinal column. It can occur in the top of the neck. It can occur in your mid-back, your lower back. <coughs> the, the most likely place is the top part of the neck because the brain stem is the fattest there and the nerves are the thickest and that's where the vagus nerve is. It can happen below there at other levels. You can have pressure on a nerve, but just because you have a pinched nerve, it doesn't mean it's a subluxation. Just because you have a pinched nerve, it doesn't mean it's a subluxation. At, at, I will tell you this, you can have a pinched nerve and not feel any pain. Huh? No. Come again? <laughs> okay, listen to this. The nerves that exit the vertebrae between the bones, only 6% of those nerves feel pain. What percent? 6%. 94% of the nerves that branch off from between the vertebrae are for function and healing and growth. So in order for you to have a pinched nerve, to truly have a pinched nerve, you normally have to have disc degeneration, you have to have a degenerative condition that's been there for a long time. And then when it sits on the nerve, it's like a cavity. You bite into the apple, and that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. I've been doing this for 30 years, guys. I, could, I mean, I've had well over you know, 50,000 cases. I've given over a million adjustments. I've seen it all. So it's not what we think. It's just like tooth decay. That's how it works. Just, just because your teeth don't hurt, it doesn't mean that you don't have a cavity, right? The absence of pain does not necessarily indicate the presence of health. And the presence of pain doesn't necessarily indicate that you're not healthy. Remember, symptoms are just signs, they're effects. So you have to do a deep dive and do your homework on these things to assess them properly. Okay, so what can subluxation cause? Negative neuroplastic changes. What is neuroplasticity? It's, it's ner new nerve pathways in your brain, like when you learn a new language or you learn how to ride a bike or you, okay, so it actually affects the brain negatively because you're impeding the, cer the cerebrospinal fluid. It, bro it blocks the normal circulation of cerebrospinal fluid. It can also block the vertebral basal or artery. You know what that is? That's the artery that brings the blood supply to the head. Guess what vertebrae that runs through? The top bone in the neck, the same one that affects the vagus nerve. Turn to your neighbor and say, wow. Oh. <laughs> wow. Okay, now listen. That may not be a big deal to you, but it's a big deal to me. You know why? My dad suffered with migraines for 40 years. And I grew up with a dysfunctional father who used to beat the living tar out of me and my brother because of his sickness and suffering. And I came home from chiropractic school one day, and he had a headache, and I set up on him and I adjusted him. And that was the last headache he ever had. He went from having massive blinding migraine headaches for 40 years every day to zero. From six different medications to zero. That was a life that was transformed. Why? Because I found and corrected the cause of where his health problem came from. Now, I thank God for that. My dad still comes up, and he still gets checked for, for preventative purposes. But it's a real thing, what I'm talking to you about, guys. And there are ways to detect subluxation. One of the ways is thermography. Does everybody know what thermography is? It's basically a heat scan. You know, They do thermography for breast exams. They can do thermography for a spinal exam. Why? Because skin temperature is controlled by the nerves, by the autonomic nervous system. And if vertebrae are out of alignment in your back, it alters the way those nerves function. And that alters the skin temperature. And that's what studies show. Conclusive shows skin temperature differentials are associated with vertebral subluxation. And you can evaluate autonomic dystonia or dysfunction by measuring skin temperature. So we can see dysfunction in the autonomic nervous system by looking at these thermal skins. Now, there, there are many of you in the room, you know, you're my patients, we do this on a regular basis to make sure that you have good autonomic balance, that you have a healthy nervous system. It's one of the tools that I use for not just initial, but follow-up assessments, right? Yes, ma'am. Can you recognize a nerve or what type of nerve someone has? Can we recognize that type of neuropathy? Through the... <clears throat> Through that? 
we could we could probably look to see what's where it may be coming from, what might be causing it. That's a great question. Um, heart rate variability. Here's another way to look at the autonomic nervous system. Is it, raise your hand if you've heard of heart rate variability. Does anybody know? Anybody? Okay. Athletes use this to determine their state of readiness for how much stress they can handle during a workout. But you can also look at it to determine the state of readiness for your body to handle stress. In other words, if you're in fight or flight or in your, you're in rest and digest. Heart rate variability can show how variable and how ready your nervous system is to handle stress. So if that makes sense, what do you want? Low variability or high variability? You want high variability, right? If you have good high heart rate variability, that means your, the variability of your heart rate can vary. It's flexible, it's adaptable to stress. But if it's fixated, if it's locked, if it's inflexible, that's not a good heart rate variability. If you have low HRV, you're in fight or flight, you're exhausted, um, you need to rest. And so we look at heart rate variability also because this allows us a window to assess somebody's nervous system. Does that make sense? Yeah. So again, for those of you guys who are patients, now you know why I do this. On every follow-up progress exam, because I want to see your nervous system. We can look at an x-ray, that shows a structure, but we're talking about function of your nervous system, right? Okay, so this, this is really valuable stuff. And um, this, is, this is how we look and see where somebody is with their health. Here's, um, getting back to research, patients with irritable bowel syndrome appear to experience symptoms that are the result of changes in the what? Autonomic nervous system, irritable bowel syndrome. Here's another one. Depression and anxiety disorders exhibit abnormally low what? Heart rate variability, yeah. Um, Here's another one, uh, fibromyalgia patients show more heart rate variability, aberrances, and in indicators of increased sympathetic activity, right? And last but not least, um, with depression, show major autonomic dysfunction. <clears throat> so there you have it. How important is your autonomic nervous system? Yeah, and if, if anything makes, makes sense tonight, you should be thinking, well, how do I assess that and if I do have an imbalance, what can I do to bring it into balance? And we've talked about some of those things tonight. But you know, here's a, here's, a, here's a plan for you to think about how to start implementing these things. You know, If you look in the middle, it says what? Time. You need time to heal. You have to give yourself time. And you have to give yourself hope, too. Because I, I don't believe there are people that are incurable. You, know, you have to believe. You have to, you have, to have an expectation. That, that you have to have hope, yes. And in some of your eyes, I see hope. And a lot of you, you want to get well. And that's the best place to start. It's the most important part to start with. And make sure you give yourself time. Healing is not an event. It's a process. Right? So you have to have the right power, fuel, the right foods, anti-inflammatory nutrition, brain support, get the wrong foods out, the right foods in. Number three, digestion. Heal and seal the what? The gut. Heal and seal the gut. He's giving you some things to do with that. Detox and repair. Now, you can't go right off and start with detox if the rest of your body is toxic and it's inflamed. Um, we see that. It doesn't work very well. You have to heal the body first, and then after you do that, then you're ready to detox. And then, <clears throat> last but not least, on top, it says what? Information. And what is that? that that's talking about the nervous system. <clears throat> now, if you have good nutrition and you're detoxing, but you still have altered vagal tone. The vagus nerve is still um, wound up. You're still sympathetic dominant. How well is that nutrition gonna be assimilated? No. no. There's gonna be some limitations if the nervous system is not addressed, if there's interference in that nervous system. So that's why that you have to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. You know, eating good, exercising, detox, supplements, all, all of the probiotics, everything that we're talking about has its place, but the information is what's governing and directing how all of that comes together in a working, functioning, and healing body. Makes sense, doesn't it? Right? Yes? We have um, certain diseases where doctors feel there is no cure. Uh, for example, one of the reasons I'm here is I have a uh, 50-year-old cousin who we, um, for the last year, now have been battling which they just really found out they're causing it to me. Well, 
start from a basis. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so let's. So what I do damage already. This is, this is a great question, and can you repeat the question? Well, it's 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 about a very serious advanced disease, and they say it's not curable. So, for something like this, let's wait till after, and, I, yeah. and I'll I'll talk to you, and we'll we'll get into that. But um, this is just something that you can make application with. Start thinking about um, putting one foot in front of the other. What causes vertebral subluxation? What causes the the bones to shift out of alignment in the spine? What can cause that? Posture. Stress, right? Chemical. Mental, physical stress, poor posture, yep. How common is vertebral subluxation? How common is it for, for us to, as human beings, to have misalignments in the spine? Very common. <coughs> Very common, yeah. Yep, it starts, a lot of times it starts from the, the day we take our first breath. A thousand infants were checked in this study, a uh, medical study. 80% uh, of them were found to have a misalignment in the upper part of the neck. And they, and they were finding that it was affecting their immune system. And because of that, they were getting colds, ear infections, upper respiratory infections. Here's another study. 1,250 infants were evaluated during the first five days of life. They found that 90% of them suffered with birth trauma and strain through the neck and cranial issues, 10% suffering severe trauma. Mm -hmm. So coming through the birth canal, using hands, vacuum extractor, forceps, pulling baby out, you know, 90 plus percent of the time. The, the, the way that we're supposed to have a baby, ideally, is what? Squatting. Squatting position. The pelvic outlet opens 20% greater and that gravity can take the babies out. That's how we had all three of our boys. And, and we, we had them, we had a midwife, and uh, they were all 10 pounds. We don't make them small in our house. But, you know, there's, there, there's a method to that. And, um, but, but at any rate, this is, this is the world that we live in. You know, we, we have uh, poor sleeping habits. We sit at a computer all day. Text neck, we're on cell phones now. Uh, we have car accidents. Sports injuries, slips, falls. Um, it's rare for me to find a spine, somebody going through their life, and not have some sort of issues that they can improve upon, just to be quite frank and honest with you. Um, you know, we take our kids early in life to go to the dentist. Our kids grow up knowing they're supposed to have regular checkups to what? To prevent problems, right? Mm -hmm. Well, spinal decay, tooth decay, it works the same way. You could prevent a lot of these problems, a lot of these health problems that we're talking about tonight. Many of them can be prevented by having as a foundation a healthy spine and nervous system. And then on top of that, implementing all the other healthy lifestyle things that we're talking about. Okay, and last but not least, side benefits. This was a study that they utilized where people did not have symptoms. They did not have pain at all. But they were getting maintenance chiropractic care. What is maintenance chiropractic care? What's performance-based chiropractic care? Hmm. You ever turn on the TV? And you see athletes getting adjusted, like on the sideline of an NFL game. You ever turn on the TV, you watch it. In the Olympics, they, they're adjusting the gold medalist. Okay? There's not, a, there's not a, a major league baseball, football, or a hockey team, or, or sports team that does not have a chiropractor. You know that. I know that. But we don't think about why. It's not for their pain. You know, the physical therapists treat their injuries, not the chiropractor. The chiropractors out there, like I was when I used to take care of the Dolphins, and, and the arena football team, I went out there before the game, and I adjusted all of them so that they would be at their what? Their best. Their speed, coordination, strength, reaction time, all that depends on a healthy nervous system. And that's what the study showed. People are under chiropractic care without symptoms at all. These were the benefits they got. Autonomic function improvement, endocrine, their hormones, cardiovascular, immune system, muscle strength, heart rate variability, range of motion, breathing, reaction time. Neurocognitive functions, visual acuity, recovery time, you know, general health of senior citizens, reduced labor times. So the performance reasons, that's what this study pointed to. So I wanted to share that with you and you know, really to close with this, just because this is, you know, my, my, my wish and my prayer is that you learn, but also even more importantly, apply. Information without application is just kind of dead in the water, you know? This is one of my first patients, I'm going way back to 1990, uh, 90, probably in the, in the late 90s, early 90s, late 90s, somewhere around there. Her name was Georgia. She walked into the office, she was kind of like this. She says, Dr. Yakin, my back is killing me, can you help me? I said, Georgia, when did that start? She said, I don't know, I just woke up like that today. I said, okay, well, come with me. I did an examination. I had to take an x-ray. 
And on the x-ray, that's what I saw. Bone was out of alignment, wrench, tilted, twisted, turned. And when I looked at the x-ray, I said, well, that's gotta be where her pain is coming from. So I said, Georgia, come on over with me. And I brought her onto the table, and I laid her down on the table. Now, very, very gently, I started uh, trying to move the bone, and she looked really brittle, she looked old, frail, and she could hardly stand up straight. So I was very gentle with her. But as I was laying my hands on her, I could feel the bones moving. I hardly had to do anything. Everything just wanted to kind of fall back in place. So I said, Georgia, come up off the table. I was done. She, she gets up off the table and she, she goes, just like this, stand straight up, stand straight up. I, and I, I couldn't believe it. And I take a look at her, but all of a sudden I notice she has a, an insulin pump on her belt. I said, oh, you're, you're diabetic. I didn't know that. She's like, yeah, are you done? I said, yeah. Uh, come back tomorrow. Let me just check up on you, make sure you're doing okay. She's like, thank you. She leaves. An hour later, somebody opens the door, screaming at the top of their lungs. Call an ambulance. One of your patients has passed out her car. I said, oh my gosh, it's Georgia. She slumped over the steering wheel. I called the ambulance, hung up the phone. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, she's diabetic. I bet yet it has something to do with her, her blood sugar. So I got some orange juice, and I came out, and I started tap, yeah, tap, tapping her lips. And you know what happened? She started coming to then the ambulance came and carted her away, and I'm walking back in my office thinking to myself, what happened? What did, I, what, what did I just do? I thought I was the hero. I made her stand up straight, and now I put her in the hospital. Didn't, didn't sleep that much that night. I came in the office trying to study, figure out what happened, what went wrong. I'll make a long story short. I'm, I'm adjusting patients. It's a very busy morning, and all of a sudden, I hear the door open. And I look up, and guess who it is? It's Georgia. And it was like that next day. She came, she opened the door, and she's smiling. She's standing there smiling, she's glowing, she looks 10 years younger. And she ran right up to me. She gives me a big hug. What's, what's going on? She's like, I don't know what you did yesterday, but I haven't slept this good and felt this good in 40 years. Can I have another adjustment? And I said, yes, you can, but I need to show you something before I do. Because yesterday, when you left, I thought I put you in the hospital, I thought I did something wrong, but I think I did something right. Let me show you what I think happened. See that chart over there? That's, that's your nervous system. And I, and I circled that. I said, you see that area right there? Where do those nerves branch off and go to? They go to your stomach and your pancreas. And Georgia, what I did was when I moved the bone and I took the pressure off the nerve, started stimulating the nerve going over your pancreas. And your pancreas started regaining function, but your pump was still on. Your pancreas started regaining function, making insulin, but your pump was still on, so you got too much. And that's why, that's why you passed out. She's like, hmm. That makes sense. Are you going to address me now or what? <laughs> so, all right, I just, she just didn't care. She felt so good. I was yeah. fine with that. I kept adjusting her. We do her first progress evaluation. Four weeks later, she told me that her back didn't hurt since that first adjustment, but she did tell me that her endocrinologist started reducing her insulin requirements. She was on eight units when she first started. She was down to five units. Yeah. And I kept adjusting her by her next progress evaluation. She was down to three units. At the five month point, she was down to 0.8 units. She went from eight units to 0.8 units in five months. Now, I didn't do that, her endocrinologist did that because her body started to regain function. She wasn't dependent on as much. Comes the day, she tells me, they have her eligible for a special study at the University of Miami. Her, her endocrinologist wants to know what my clinical protocol was for reversing diabetes, if I'd be willing to share that. And so what's my thought? I'm not curing anything, I'm not healing anything, all I did was I, I just happened to find and remove the cause of her diabetes. I didn't know that that's what was causing her diabetes, but, but I did what I was supposed to do. I found and removed the interference and let the power that made her body heal her body. The potential is always there. Your body wants to get well. It doesn't need any help, it just needs no interference. Remember in the beginning, you guys agreed, you said, you believe that you were born to be healthy, right? There are, there's no limitation to the power or the intelligence, ready, willing, and able to flow from above down and go to work and do that. If you give it the right ingredients, the right food, the right you know, vitamins, the right minerals, exercise, detox, you put it all together, you have a powerful, proactive plan to get to your best. Does that make sense? Um, so, you know, so all I did was help her get back to her, her God-given potential. How many of you guys want to be at 100% of your God-given potential? All of us, that's your birthright. That's, your, that's everybody's birthright. That's why when I do one of these events, I, I don't not give an opportunity for everybody to have their spine checked. I always make it a point to make sure if you 
haven't had your nervous system checked, and we, I showed you all of the technology that we use, if you haven't done that, I'm not gonna let you leave here without an opportunity to do that. It's very simple. You have the scans done, you have x-rays, you have a consultation, you have an exam, we put it all together, and we show you. This is how your nervous system is working. Um, if you have health problems, then we point to, oh, this may be stemming from that. If you don't have any health problems, but you've discovered something that you can improve on, wow, what a great place to start. Correcting health issues before they have a chance to even rear their ugly head. Either way, it's, it's super important. Wouldn't you agree? So, so normally for you know, the consultation, the exam, the scans, the x-rays, um, that's usually closer to $500. But for a special event like this, we do that $150 for the individual, $250 for the entire family. So if you've got somebody who's not here with you tonight, a family member, kids, whoever, you're welcome to do that, the entire family for only 250. So that's why we do this, because it's an amazing opportunity for people to learn what they can do to improve their life, especially the nervous system, which probably hasn't been checked in a long time, if ever. Based on what you learned tonight, wouldn't you agree it's probably a good idea to have your nervous system checked every once in a blue moon? <laughs> yeah, I got it. So, so here's, what, here's what we did. Normally there's a, a waiting list as far as uh, the new patient appointments in our office. We're usually booked out a couple of weeks out. I specifically got with Tamara and Deborah. I told them, I said, listen, this is what we're doing tonight. There are gonna be guests here, so I wanna make sure that you clear our appointment schedule. Make sure we make room for the next two weeks so that you guys have access to have your new patient appointments. Okay, so, that, so the offer that I just uh, made to you is good for the next two weeks. All right, now, here's the thing. The appointments need to be made tonight because, again, we altered our schedule to make this possible for you. We've had this happen in the past where people are like, oh, let me check my schedule, um, I'll think about it, I'll call you, and honestly, let's be real, you know, that, that day just doesn't come. And that's fine. But the people that I know who are committed to making an amazing change in their health and their life, these are the people that you know I know I can help. So I want you to make the appointment tonight. Don't leave tonight without making that appointment. Mm -hmm. If you're serious about your health and you want to learn about this and make a change, do not leave without making the appointment. You can call and reschedule if you have to, but at least make the commitment to take a good step forward for your life. In good faith, make that commitment. And so, that's a good question. Okay, so as far as insurance goes, I am not a provider for any insurances. And what that means to you is that you have the relationship with your insurance company we, make it, we go to exceeding lengths to make our care affordable, and we take care of, of entire families. So our, our fee system is geared for people who don't have insurance. If you have out of network benefits, you'll get reimbursed by your insurance company because we give you a super bill. We give you an itemized bill. You submit it to them according to your contract. They'll reimburse you based on that. Now, one of the reasons why we do this, this, uh, this you know, the 150 for the first visit, is because that's gonna enable you to get that first visit, the consult, the exam, all the testing, irregardless of your insurance. Now, if you want to bring in a copy of your card and you want us to call it in and find out, we're happy to do that. Sometimes they're out of network benefits, sometimes not. I would say 95% of our patients are out of network and they just pay out of pocket. And that's because, again, our stuff is, everything that we do here is super affordable. We go to great lengths to make sure that we give quality care at affordable rate. So that's why I've set this up the way that I did. The place to start is to take the next step. Um, now, this, these are two visits that we're talking about, by the way. That special offer that I made for you, it's two visits, why? The first day when you come in, I do the consultation, we do the exam, we'll do the testing. Uh, more than likely, if, if we see any abnormal findings, we take x-rays. I study all of that. So I put together a very detailed report for you, and I have to prepare, I have to study everything so I know what I'm talking about. Come back the next time, I'll go over everything with you, answer all of your questions. If there's a need for care or whatever the case is, we can go over a course of action for correction at that point. Both of those visits are covered for the 150 for the individual or the 250 for the family. Does that make sense? This way we can take you full circle through the process and make sure that you get all your questions answered. Most importantly, make application with um, you know what we talked about tonight, right? Okay, so, for those of you who are guests, in a minute I'm gonna have you walk up to the front. Tomorrow and Deborah have all the appointments there for over the next two weeks and they'll accommodate everybody. Um, 
for those of you guys who are my patients, normally when we do this, if you have questions about nutrition or supplements or stuff like that, please allow Deborah and Tamara to accommodate our guests first, and um, you know we can follow up with any other questions like that you normally do at the end of our workshop. Tonight's just a little bit different. We want to make sure that the guests get what they need before they leave. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay, so for those of you who have questions, I'm do, I'm in the, for the sake of time, I'm gonna let you guys go ahead, go up to the front, make your appointments. Those of you who have questions, come see me. I'll spend as much time as I need to with you up here one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you guys, I appreciate you for coming tonight.